Ethiopia, the land of our fathers, the land where the gods love to be. As storm cloud and night suddenly gathers, our armies come rushing to thee. We must in the fight be victorious, when swords are thrust outward to me. For us will the victory be glorious, when led by the red, black, and green. Advance, advance to victory, let Africa be free. Advance, advance to meet the foe. Advance, advance to meet the foe. With the might of the red, the black, and the green. With the might of the red, the black, and the green. Ethiopia, the tyrant's falling, who smote thee upon thy knees. And thy children are lustily called. From over the distant seas, Jehovah, the Great One, has heard us, has noted our sighs and our tears. With the spirit of love, He has served us to be one through the coming years. Advance, advance to victory, let Africa be free. Advance, advance to meet the foe. Advance, advance to meet the foe. With the might of the red, the black, and the green. With the might of the red, the black, and the green. O Jehovah, the God of it. Unto our sons that lead the wisdom thou gave to thy sages when Israel was sore in need. Thy voice in the dim has spoken, Ethiopia shall stretch forth a hand. hand, by thee shall our fetters be broken. And then bless our dear fatherland. Advance, advance to victory. Let Africa be free. Advance, advance to meet the foe. Advance, advance to meet the foe. With the might of the red. The might of the red, the black, and the green. 
ilegbako ilegbako na 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 il est bako, 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 il est bako. Ever so often. A spirit leaves or ruins the home of the ancestors and come to earth. A spirit that is larger than life. A spirit who leaves the legacy behind and who charter a course that we must follow. Ibashi, Marcus Mosiah. And as we are here at this Queen Sparks TV show, at this, my brothers, I'm hoping, and the sisters in the audience, that somewhere along the lines, we get to change the name from Queen Spark to whatever else. Uh, This Mosiah, who would have impacted on the entire world, made the pilgrimage to this sacred land, Barbados. And indeed, would have spoken at our Queen Sparks Tea Shed right here in Queen Spark. And he would have said words of revolution to our people and he would have impacted on our people just like he would have impacted on the entire world. This man, this Messiah, this Marcus Mosiah Carvey. We would have had many people who would have gone on to make strides in relation to developing this country, none other than Errol Walton Barra, Ibashi, Clement Payne, Ibashi, Israel Lovell, Ibashi, Charles Duncan O'Neill, Ibashi, Ulrich Grant, Ibashi, Menzies Case, and all the others too numerous to mention. And I know that they had some women in there too, but unfortunately, we don't pay much attention to the women because our history was taught to us by the Europeans. Pangina Gibbs, Ibashi, 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 Ibashi. Give thanks for the legacy of Marcus Mosiah Garvey and the ones he would have influenced. It was him who would have brought us to this juncture. I look back on the life of Marcus Mosiah Garvey and I tried to compare it to our lives. The man who would have left that legacy, the man who would have passed on the baton. And I said, did we do enough? Or did we drop that battle? Too often we argue about frivolousness. Marcus Garvey had the ships, had the, the nurses, has everything in place. And we are still lagging behind. Ibashi, Ibashi. Wali yo. Wali ing gung gung wali yo. Wali ing gung gung wali yo. 
Pleasant good evening. Senator, Mr. John Kingston, Government Special Advisor on Culture and Heritage, members of the Diplomatic Corps, members of the Board of the National Cultural Foundation, Mr. Carol Roberts Rifa, Chief Executive Officer, and other members of staff of the National Cultural Foundation, Dr. Rodney World, lecturer at UWA and our featured speaker for this evening, members of the Pan-African Movement, the Honorable Trevor Prescott, Special Envoy on Reparations and Economic Enfranchisement in the Prime Minister's Office, persons watching online, specially invited guests. God had given them minds with which to rule and to regulate the world. If they prayed because they were not getting enough out of the world, their prayers would not avail them much. But if they prayed for intelligence and confidence in themselves, they would receive more than they could desire. Why should they take God for an employment agent? God did not build cities. Of all the beautiful cities in the world, man was the architect. The words of Marcus Messiah Garvey. Good evening again, and my name is Rodney Grant, Chairman of the Barbados Intangible Cultural Heritage Committee, and I am your host for this evening. As Barbados continues to celebrate the season of emancipation, the, the Prime Minister's Office Culture and the National Con Cultural Foundation are commemorating the life and times of the Jamaican Pan-Africanist Marcus Garvey at this historic location, Queen's Park. Queen's Park holds great significance to the Marcus Garvey Day since it was at the Queen's Park Steel Shed where he delivered a powerful lecture to hundreds of his supporters entitled Intelligence versus Ignorance. In the early hours of October the 18th, 1937, leader of the Pan-Africanist movement and president general of the Universal Negro Improvement Association, Marcus Garvey, sailed into Barbados on the CNS Lady Nelson. Thousands of black Barbadians gathered at the pierhead to glimpse the revolutionary Pan-Africanist from St. Anne, Jamaica. Garvey was greeted by several dignitaries from the local UNIA branches and the local business sector. This evening, the Prime Minister's Office Culture and the NCF has produced this event to highlight Jamaicans Marcus Garvey's influence on the development of Pan-Africanism in Barbados and the wider Barbadian society in general during the 20th century and the first two decades of the 21st century. Ladies and gentlemen, before we get into the main event, I want to introduce to you Damien Damani Reed. Reed. He's a Barbadian spoken word artist and poet. 
having a keen interest in the lyricism and performance, Damani Ri began his artistic career as a conscious rapper during his college years, but was soon drawn into the world of spoken word and poetry. His newfound love for the art form led him to compete in a talent competition at the Hilton Hotel, and he won with his piece entitled Emancipation. Today, Emancipation remains one of the most popular pieces with its biting commentary on matters of liberation of people of the African diaspora in Barbados. The Maniri is twice a winner of Star Search and a 2013 NIFCA Bronze Awardee. We now have the pleasure of inviting the Maniri to perform a piece entitled Black Castor Oil. Black Castor Oil and he's supported by Raheem Waldrum on the Jim Bay drums. Thank you very much. Black Castor Oil, masters of the soil, forecasters of the future. The doulers, babalos, riding heaven clothes to bring forth showers of blessings. The Jim Beard boss drummer, covered in kentia cloth, beating and chanting that rhythmic come to me. Never leave me. Forever Ifa. Bush teas that never favor fevers. Burning sage leave aroma, putting evil spirits in a coma. The black persona. Black castor oil, organic and unspoiled. Put it in the air to strengthen the roots. Sleeping in the crown chakra, unshackling the truth like Shaka Zulu and his troops. Shielding the culture from foreign invaders, tomb raiders, and naysayers. We? We some revolutionary game changers. Filmmakers. All oh, black cast. Black cast troll. They cannot place an embargo on our embryos. Our children will grow to be griots. Telling the story of African glory. Celebration of heroes that bleed, red, gold, and green, by any means necessary. One God, one aim, one destiny. From the continent to the Caribbean, that dream is manifesting. Black castor oil, massaging the joints of the disjointed. We are our own saviors anointed. Establishing phases of the moon. They desecrated our tombs, but they cannot desecrate our greatness. Artists? Nah! Sages on stages, resurrecting papyrus pages through speech. The black caster oil. The two. Damn. Sweet. Whether famous, blacklisted, or nameless. One fact is, every stroke of the brush, hammer, chisel, or what you might call it, gadget, in fact, this, your world changes. My world changes. Our world changes. 
black cast royal carvers of your own future masters of your own peace the black cast royal you took down God never justified wealth or poverty. Men did that themselves. He never made a thief or a liar. Every man made himself to suit himself as far as his character went. Marcus Messiah Garvey. Dr. Rodney Whirl is a lecturer in the Department of History and Philosophy at the University of the West Indies of Hill Campus. He has written extensively on Pan-Africanism. His latest book is George Padmore's Black Internationalism. This evening's featured speaker will present on Marcus Messiah Garvey, the Jamaican-born Pan-Africanist, who was a major influence on the development of Pan-Africanism in Barbados and the wider Barbadian society in general during the 20th century and the first two decades of the 21st century. Many of the outstanding political and labor leaders in the 1920s and 30s were followers of Garvey, including Charles Duncan O'Neill, Israel Lovell, John Beckles, Clennell Wickham, Alexandrina Gibbs, Ruth Manning, Frederick Small, Ulrich Grant, and Clement Payne. Although Garvey died in 1940, his ideas continue to resonate with the Barbadian people, politicians governments, Rastafarian, Rastafarians, and the Pan-African formations that emerged in the second half of the 20th century and the early 21st century. The Black Power Movement witnessed the restatement of Garvey's core ideas. Ladies and gentlemen, to deliver the feature lecture, Marcus Garvey's impact on the Barbadian landscape, 1919 to 2019, Dr. Rodney yeah. 
Thank you. Senator John King, members of the Diplomatic Corps, CEO of the National Cultural Foundation, Carol Roberts Reefer, MP Trevor Prescott, Special Envoy on Reparations and Affirmative Action. Comrades, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to thank the National Cultural Foundation for hosting this event. Similar type events like this one is being held all over the world. Um, earlier, I was approached um, to sit on two panel discussions commemorating the 135th anniversary of the birth of Marcus Garvey. And not only because of the current moment, but Garveyites or Pan-Africanists in Barbados in the 20s and 30s used to commemorate the birthday of Marcus Garvey. In fact, August, Today, August is special in the United States. We talk about Black August. But August was, was special inside of Barbados because the 1st of August was Emancipation Day. The 17th was Garvey's birthday. And the 31st was supposed to be a public holiday given the declaration of the peoples that was presented um, in 1920 at Garvey's important um, people's Conference. I yeah, want to thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, somehow you, 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 you took a chance in inviting me. So um, I hope that I don't let you down. Yeah, I, I wish to thank Sister Michelle Springer um, for reaching out to me. And I also want to thank Stacey O'Brien for doing an excellent job in selling this event. Um, before I begin my address, however, I want to call on the name of Kofi Akobi, my, my president and general secretary with the Pan-African Movement, and also my mentor and advisor, and I can see Brother Kofi looking down at me as I'm about to, to ground with the people. Um, hopefully, sometime in the future, I can have a more fulsome discourse on the outstanding contribution of Kofi Akobi to Pan-Africanism inside of Barbados. Long live my brother. Long live Kofi Akobi. This talk um, is very ambitious, and I don't intend to yeah, take you through um, a very long discourse. I prefer yeah, to have um, engagement in terms of questions. But I want to speak about um, Garvey's, some of Garvey's ideas and his political practice because um, these ideas not only resonated with Barbadians, with Pan-Africanists, but they transcended Pan-Africanism, um, and they also transcended generations as well. So um, we can still see some of the relevance of some of Garvey's ideas, and his ideas had a major impact. Uh, and, and, and I begin my talk, 1919, which was when you had the creation of the first UNIA movement um, in Barbados. The Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey, who is a national hero of Jamaica, a prophet to some Rastafarians, member of the Trinity by another section of Rastafarians, de facto national hero of the masses of Caribbean people, was the most important West Indian in the 20th century. Garvey provided hope and inspirations for persons of African descent who were really in the pits of 
economic, psychological, political um, degradation because they were part of a brutal, exploitative capitalist system, a brutal, exploitative colonial system. And Garvey, after extensive travels, came to the harsh realization that black people were at the bottom of the socio-economic ladder in Latin America, in the Caribbean, in Europe, and in North America. But Garvey, instead of wallowing in pity and defeatism, decided to create an entity that would be the instrument for redressing these disabilities facing the African people. And this is when he created the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Community Leagues. Well, later on, we just speak about the UNIA um, because the AC ACL, right, was, uh, was not utilized a lot after. Um, and Garvey recognized that if the race was oppressed on racial grounds because of the racist capitalist system, therefore, any program of liberation must begin with race first, and it must be buttressed by self-reliance and racial pride. And after Garvey migrated to the United States, and I'm yeah, going over um, a lot of things that you already know, but as a teacher, I don't take things for, for, for granted. So um, just a bit of revision. It was in the United States that the UNIA started to explode after the first great European war. And after the first great European war, one witnessed a resurgence of racism inside the United States of America. We're living in such a moment now. But this resur resurgence of racism was fueled by the Klan. It was manifested in the red summer of 1919, where you had over 25 race riots taking place in the United States. Um, it was brought about because of hardships emerging as a result of the Great War, increase in the cost of living, etc. But this was also a period where the roots of colonialism was shaken with the coming on stream or the successful Russian or the Bolshevik revolution. Branches of the UNIA were established in over 40 countries, maybe 41 countries. Therefore, the UNIA was the largest Pan-African organization, and it was also the largest Pan-Caribbean organization. Not to be left out, the first branch of the UNIA was formed in Barbados in 1919, and I suspect, haven't seen the docu any documents suggesting a precise date, um, one can safely speculate that it was sometime late in 1919, and this branch was the Reed Street, Tudor Street branch, number 40. And number 40 would give you some idea that it was one of the early branches, because when the second branch was formed, the Westbury branch number formed in 1920, the number was 229. So this gives an indication of the explosion of um, Garveyite branches across the world, and John Beckles, the owner of the Black Cat Laundry, who played a major role in this organization, um, he became the president of this entity, and some of the 
leading members were mem people like Clennon Wickham, Harold Wilson, who not only was a leading Garveyite in Barbados, but he, be he became a leading Garveyite in Antigua. And he was also one, well, the only Barbadian that attended the 1920 People's Conference. Um, J.T. Ramsey, he was also one of the important members of this entity. And unlike <laughs> the earlier historians, my sister Andrea, I, 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 I will call the name of four important women, Lolita Smidden, Christina Allen, Otty Carrington, Alonsi Alkins, and these were four teachers who taught in the Garvey Night School put on by the Ree Street, Tudor Street branch of the UNIA. Also, I will mention the name of Eldika Griffith, who was one of the trustees of this school as well. So, um, women, and I yeah, I, I wrote uh, an article on women in the Garveyite movement in, in Barbados, so hopefully it will come out sometime and we will see that women did play, play important roles inside of this branch as well. A second branch, and this um, second branch was the West Barry branch, which was formed early in 1920. This branch was led by Israel Lovell. And some of the other outstanding members of this branch, John Catwell, Melvin Ennis, John Arlene, Alexandrina Gibbs, who emerged as not only one of the lead, not only the leading fe female ideologue, but she was one of the leading ideologues of this branch as well. So um, I'm glad that David did mention Alexandrina Gibbs when John was performing the libations. Now the Westbury branch was responsible for the initial invitation when Garvey visited in October 1937. Um, and when Garvey came as well, because by this time, the Ree Street, Trudor Street branch stopped functioning in the mid-1920s. It was the Westbury branch that was still functioning, and Garvey went to the Liberty Hall, where he was given a guard of honor, by members of the landship, and I was expecting <laughs> the members of the landship to give me that honor. <laughs> However, um, a lot of Garveyites had gone into the, the landship movement in the 1930s. Other UNA branches, Half Moon Fort, Crab Hill, um, recently, I saw a document that suggested that a branch was in Spikestown. Aline, John Aling said that he, um, he used to go to places, Spikestown and other places where branches were located. And there would get back home 2 to 3 o'clock in the morning. They used to ride a donkey. Um, and he also said that some of these branches became inactive because they were unable to visit them and give them support. Now, it was relatively easy to create a UNIA branch. Seven individuals of liberal education could apply, um, organize themselves, apply to the headquarters, and they would get the necessary Charter, but very little is known of these branches. And it would be remiss of me if I did not mention 
There was a Garvey branch formed in Barbados in 1987. And this branch was formed as part of the celebration of the 100th anniversary of Garvey's birthday. And this branch was formed by Martin Cadogan, the staunch Garveyite, former member of Carlos Cook's African Nationalist Party um, movement. He was the president. And the other members were Viola Davis, Trevor Marshall, and Olu Walren. So we can see that the Garvey branches, in this case, with the 1987 branch, um, transcended or went beyond the period that Garvey was alive. Thank you. Now, the Workings Men's Association was a Garvey organization as well. Um, although it was not a UNIA branch, it was a Garvey organization. And I, in saying this, I will demonstrate to you why it was a Garvey organization. Dr. Charles Duncan O'Neill, the patron saint of the Workers Men's Association, became a Garvey when he was in Trinidad. And he sought to pattern the Workers Men's Association on the Trinidad Workers Men's Association. But at the time, the Trinidad Workers Men's Association philosophy was rooted in Fabian socialism and in Pan Africanism, with many of the Garveyites playing leading roles within the organization. And O'Neill said that while it was not Garvey movement in the true sense, um, he said it was inspired by Garvey. So at their meetings, they would read from Garvey's newspaper, and they would also sing the Red Anthem. So they practiced Pan-Africanism and Fabian socialism as well. If you look at the economic principles of the Working Men's Association as well, we can clearly see that it was based on Garvey's cooperative economics because O'Neill said what was uppermost in their minds when they created this entity was that it would be modeled along Garvey's lines and they hoped that they would reach, evolve, develop to the stage where they would be able to build their own factories. So they're talking about building their own sugar factories where they would grind their own canes. And part of the thinking was that they helped to make white businesses successful. The Costas, Harsons, the Ideal Store, etc. And the, the thinking was that they needed to make black businesses successful as well, where these black businesses would um, hire black people. Out of the Workers Men's Association was the Barbados Workers Union Cooperative Company. And the Workers Men's Loans and Friendly Investment Society. Out of this entity, they have had a store and a pharmacy on the corner of Reed Street and Bastards Road. But what was important about this pharmacy, that it was written in bold letters, owned by the workers, managed by the workers for the benefit of the workers. Unfortunately, this store collapsed after a few years. So I, I hope that I demonstrated 
um, that the work is men's association was a Garvey entity. Now the decision to become a Garvey was not the easiest decision in the world. It was the obvious one, but it was not the easiest one. And I said it was not the easiest one because of the level of repression that was meted out to the, the Garveyites. Those who were strong enough, those who were bold enough, right? They joined these entities with a sense of pride, right? The colonial authorities tried to stymie the Garveyite movement in Barbados um, because it was viewed as a threat to the existing status quo. Um, for example, the authorities tried to pass a seditious um, publication ordinance, so they wanted to curb or take pot shots. Um, this was maybe a step before they banned the Negro world. The police constantly monitored the meetings, constantly harassed the Garveyite. O'Neill complained that the police were using Irvy method to um, destroy them. It was said that persons were paid a princely sum of $200. And if you think about $200 in the 1920s, this was a princely sum to go and join uh, the Workers' Men's Association, etc., and to destroy the movement from inside. In April 1928, right, and, and we talk about Garvey coming in 37, but before we get there, in 1928, the authorities refused to let Garvey land inside of Barbados. Um, in 1927, March, they passed the undesirable... I think the expulsion of the Undesirables Act in 1927. And when they heard that, when the Garveyites heard that Garvey was coming to Barbados, they were all excited and they were formulating all of these plans to see their leader. Unfortunately, these plans were dashed. And when they heard that Garvey was going to be on a ship and he could not come into the port, they planned to hire boats and go and abandon work and, yes, yeah, celebrate with Garvey. But this did not happen. The inspector general of the police, he wrote the colonial secretary, Instructing the, or telling the colonial secretary it would not be advisable to allow Garvey to come to Barbados and they should inform the Jamaican authorities as well. Garvey stopped in transit in 1928, November, but he was not allowed to come on the island. But Garvey was extremely peeved to the point where he wrote a letter, he wrote a petition to the League of Nations and he complained that the governor of Barbados wrote to the governor of another country asking him not to issue a passport to a certain influential black man who had contemplated visiting Barbados to confer with the poor people of the island relative to some means of improving themselves. As Brother Grant said earlier, Garvey did finally get permission in 1937 to visit Barbados. 
by 1937, however, Garvey was no longer the threat that he was a decade before. The UNIA movement internationally was very much in decline. The UNIA movement locally was very much in decline. And this was also, um, while there was a lot of excitement in the fact that the working people wanted to see Garvey, this was tinged because some of the working people, the Garveyites, were in prison. And this was the period of the October Assizes. So the Israel Lovells and the Ulrich Grants, many of the labor leaders, and also Garveyites who participated in the labor struggles. Um, they were unable to share the joy of seeing Marcus Garvey inside the flesh. Um, but Garvey was still popular on the island, as was manifested by the thousands of Barbadians who gathered at all vantage points to take a look at the great Marcus Garvey. Um, it was said when the, I think, Marcia Burroughs was telling me that um, when the, the vehicle that Garvey was traveling and went down Bay Street, hundreds of persons were just running behind this vehicle. Um, and Garvey did deliver a lecture in Queen's Park Steel Shed. Um, this a huge lecture. In fact, it was said to be one of the largest crowds, um, I, I guess, assembled inside of Queen's Park. Um, but also, and I believe not just the lecture, but there was a luncheon as well. The luncheon was at Queen's Park House. This luncheon was significant because John Beckles was asked to raise the first toast. And John Beckel said that the Garveyites were yearning for this moment for many years. And Hilton Vaughan, who also um, raised a toast as well, he said that Garvey's aims and thoughts had been misconstrued. And the day will surely come when his endeavors would be appreciated. Now, the UNIA and the Workers' Men's Association sought to instill pride in their members to raise their self-esteem. And easily, the racist, the most racist um, territory inside the Caribbean, right? the, the, the bees had the dubious distinction, Barbados, Bahamas, and Bermuda. And if you don't believe me, even down to the 1950s, when there was a discussion about um, having Barbados as the site or the capital of the West Indian Federation, right? People were still saying that Barbados, no, you can't locate the Federation in Barbados because it is very racist, right? <laughs> Good. Now, so... Um, Garvey instilled in his followers that they had the same, that they were equal to whites. And this was very much evident in the language of the Garveyites, who now went around saying, a black skin, no longer as a badge of shame, but they saw this as a badge of, of pride. And they were saying that they have the same five senses, of, of whites. Now, when Clement Payne came to Barbados in 1937, right, he did mention that he still saw that some Barbadians had this inferiority fixation. And this was evident in the way that they interface with white people. And he counseled them. <laughs> um, to speak to whites in the same manner that he spoke to the colonial secretary as well. And if we move to the period of 
black, the black power era in the 19, late 60s, early 1970s. Elon Bear Montley, who was one of the major um, black power figures in Black Knight, he was telling Barbadians to re evaluate the misrepresentations about themselves. Right, so this is a really a restatement of what Garvey had said many years ago. Um, and, and Elombe said, for example, that yeah, they were now to see themselves as black and beautiful and kinky here is good. The Rastafarians, however, didn't have this problem because from the inception the Rastafarians have all, always asserted black is beautiful and kinky hair was now a crown of glory. So they didn't have um, th th this problem. And th the racism, still talking about th this racism was playing out itself in fairly contradictory um, positions as well. On the one hand, blacks felt that they were the equal to whites. But even down to the late 80s, early 90s, and I, I hope it, it is no longer there, there was this perception that somehow that whites were innately better businessmen than blacks. And this, was, this came to a head with the struggle for the mutual, or well, the mutual affair, and Professor Beckles, Walter Ramsey, David Cominshaw, and um, members of the Bassa Committee, um, I hope, I'm, I'm hopeful that they've put that to rest once and for all. But this was still this contradiction going on there. Um, right. Garvey wanted to liberate Africa from the clutches of European colonialism, European imperialism. He wanted to see the construction of a strong African nation or united African nation that would be the custodian of all black people. Um, Garvey preoccupation was rooted in the Pan-Africanist tradition that he was now a part of. Um, in July 1920, Garvey wrote a letter to the Garvey X in Barbados, where he told him that he was going to relocate his headquarters after the People's Conference of 1920. But the Liberian government refused to grant Garvey permission to relocate his headquarters, but notwithstanding this setback, the Garvey in Barbados continue to express uh, their desire to repatriate to Africa, or some of them talk about visiting Africa. In the early 1930s, Discussion was rife in Barbados about sending some Barbadians to British Guyana to alleviate the level, the high levels of unemployment in Barbados. But the Garvey's were clear. The only place that we want to be relocated is to Liberia. Um, right, they said, yeah, one John Hawkins brought us to the Caribbean, another John Hawkins, this is the racist one now, um, wanted to take them from Barbados, but they wanted to go back, or they wanted to go to Africa. And Garvey's ideas were repeated by Didi Garner in the 1950s. Didi Garner was a representative from St. Philip, and his phraseology and ideology was very much um, smart of a Garvey in the, the 20s and the 30s. It's a remarkable um, reading. Um, 
some of his thoughts. For example, he was saying that the discussion about getting Barbadians to go abroad and work in North America, and he was of the view that we should be trying to get some of these people to go and work in Africa. So um, Didi Garner echoed the sentiments of Garvey. And again, I must yeah, compliment, or I must mention that repatriation was, and I believe still is, um, one of the staples of the Rastafarians. And when we think about the assistance that Barbadians give to the anti-apartheid movement in Southern Africa, right, um, it is clearly that this was influenced by Garvey desire not only to see the Europeans, but it was also out of Africa, but it's also, it was also rooted in this unity of, 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 in the struggle and um, the need for a strong, united Africa that would be the custodians of Africans at home and those abroad. And these calls were calls for closer links, closer cooperation, were echoed by the Clement Payne movement, the Pan-African movement of Barbados, the Marcus Garvey 100th Anniversary Committee. Um, so we can clearly see the evidence of Garveyism inside of these calls. In fact, the establishment of embassies in Ghana and Kenya, as well as the desire <laughs> to trade and foster air links and direct links with Africa. Right? When Garvey was formulating his Black Star Line, right? this was Garvey had a conception of, of Pan-African trade, right? trade between the diaspora trade among the diaspora and trade among the diaspora and, 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 and Africa. So in a sense, this is very much um, part of the Garvey's thinking. History, and I, I'll wrap up shortly, right? For Garvey, history was a tool for fostering black pride and, em and emancipation. And Garvey talked about canonizing our saints, create our martyrs, etc. Payne, in the 1930s, criticized the Eurocentric nature of the colonial curriculum and called for the teaching on, of our black poets and our um, black philosophers. In particular, he mentioned Mary Shaw, the Pan-Africanist from Grenada, and our own Plenal Wickham. Um, this was also echoed in the in 1969 when Leroy here would, um, wrote his small work on black powerlessness in Barbados. Um, he talked the only way that Leroy talked about black children are drug senseless with European history or a distorted history written by prejudicial Europeans. Now, we can say with the advent of CXC, this is no longer the case as the content is more reflective of the Caribbean realities. The challenge, however, is that insufficient number of students are pursuing history and literature. The canonization of our heroes is also rooted in this call for national heroes. 1936, uh, Laville is saying that he's calling for a permanent monument for Duncan O'Neill. And Anybody who studied Barbados in the 1920s and the 1930s would know that O'Neill was 
a national hero. A historian didn't have to go and do any research and tell people this. The people knew that Charles Duncan O'Neill was a national hero. And to Lovell and the disciples of O'Neill. This is why Lovell could call for O'Neill uh, as for a permanent monument for O'Neill in 1936. This is why Lovell could call for or who made the bold statement that Samuel Jackman Prescott was the only politician in the history of Parliament up to that period who did anything good for his people. And this is why in 1966 that Calvin Aline, who was the General Secretary of the People's Progressive Movement, could call for the statue of Lord Nelson to, re to be removed and replaced by Samuel Jackman Prescott. And this is why the PPM made the call for the tearing down of these imperialist statues and renaming the streets. And these sentiments were echoed by Black Knight as well, out of the BASA Awards, the BASA com Committee as well. Um, in the sense that, yeah, the Bassa name was popularized, and we knew. <laughs> we didn't have to wait for the historians to tell us these things. That Bassa was a national hero, because as a Garveyite, we talk about the martyrs. And this is why, in the later on, David Commission and the Clement Payne Union consistently lobbied for Clement Payne and the heroes of the labor rebellions of 1937 to become national heroes. Um, I can go on, but I will say that if you look at the labor activism on the island, right, this labor activism was fueled. The industrial ferment of the 1920s was fueled by the Garveyites, and the Garveyites were clear that um, the people should be properly compensated. And we're talking about a period of brutal exploitation. Hence, we're talking about the Workers' Men's Association. And this is a, not a real trade union. And I say not a real trade union because trade unions were illegal. And we only have to cast our minds to the ill-fated dot workers' strike of 1927, um, but the workers' minds were still in the vanguard of labor agitation. And when the West Indian Commission came to Barbados in 1929, um, they sought to be the de facto representatives of workers presenting a memorandum with the grievances of the agricultural workers and Frederick Small, Louis Sibro, and Ruth Manning address the commission at the public hearings. And Ruth Manning was very practical, and she said, you know, the reason for this widespread starvation in Barbie, this is because of the poor wages being paid to the workers. She also talked about a wicked practice where <laughs> the planters, especially in some of the rural spaces, would come to town for the money on Fridays and remain in town gambling and having fun. And workers were paid nine o'clock on Saturday nights and all of these kinds of things. So we're talking about some real um, terrible practices that were um, inflicted on working people. And after Garvey launched his political party in Jamaica, this led the Workers' Men's Association to form the Barbados Workers' Political Club with the intention to get more blacks in the House of Assembly. So in 1929, I think there was one black person, Chrissy Braffy. Um, 
by 1930. There were four black persons. So Lavelle, for example, said that, you know, for many years, those of you that had the franchise voted for white people. Now, was an now is the opportunity to vote for black people. Um, fortunately, O'Neill had to wait until 1932 before he was elected. And I, in closing, I will mention that we're talking about a black theology. Right? Garvey's idea of a black God is still manifested right, in the beliefs of yeah, the Rastafarians and others, others from the African syncretic faiths, spiritual Baptists, etc. So I will close by saying that Marcus Garvey made a significant contribution to Pan-Africanism on the island. His influence transcended Pan-Africanism and encompassed all facets of Barbadian society and several generations of Barbadians. One God, one Him, one destiny. I thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Uru. I want to acknowledge the presence of Senator Dr. The Honorable Shanta Maru Knight. Minister in the Prime Minister's Office with Responsibility for Culture. Welcome, ma'am. You know, if you see me with my phone, I don't know how many people are in the same position that I am, you know. I, I have a watch, or two or three watches, and I don't think any of them actually tell time. You know, most of us now have, we use our phones to keep track of time, you know. So if you see me with my phone, it's because I'm keeping track of the time on my phone. My watch is saying something to nine. <laughs> right. So, this is the time now where we want to pose a few questions to Dr. World. There are two mics which we encourage you to use for the purposes of the live stream so that we can get the feed into the cameras. So, the floor is open to you. You just raise your hand and they take their ushers to move around, to move the mics around. Here at the front. Oh, I'm Ambassador sorry, Commission. I thought you were dealing with the microphones at the side. Um, I'm standing, so I won't go sit, sit back down. Oh, there. well, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Go ahead. Yeah, my, my name is um, Art Edwards, and I share one thing with Marcus Garvey. And as I was in boarding school for seven years, a boarding school that had like 85% white people, and only me and a few, including um, Astafan, who is now a regional figure, apparently, and he was the head of the so-called Black Power Movement within that boarding school. But Marcus Garvey grew up with, in a white neighborhood, I believe. Is that not true? He grew up with white neighbors and stuff, and he played with white children and that they kind of thing. Girl. And then, yeah, and at a certain age, he realized that he couldn't speak to them anymore because, mm -hmm. of course, he was becoming more mature. But it's because of that upbringing that he had really no fear of white people. So he had an advantage. I don't really fear white people either, to be honest with you. But I'll say this much. We have a wax museum in Bridgetown with a depiction of Marcus Garvey that we have tried to get as accurate as possible. Now, it has not been recognized until I've come to say this. It is there. And I would like to formally ask you, in the presence of the minister, um, thankfully she's here, nice to know you, to take a photo opportunity tomorrow, you tell me when you come in, you ain't gonna pay. All right, I will pay for you. Take the photo opportunity next to Marcus Garvey, and you tell me that I've made a mistake because David saw it, Mr. Ambassador Cummins, sure. and he said these cheeks ain't fat enough. <laughs> we would rather do things that are complimenting as opposed to make a mistake on the wrong side of the fence. So you come and tell me it don't look right. And if it don't look right, I will change it just because you say so. You tell me the time, I think Mr. Grant will give you a number. And uh, we could work this thing out tomorrow. You and me, God, you? Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, you want to respond or you want to take uh, another question? No, I didn't yeah. go ahead. Uh, um, Ambassador, I think you may have to move to the mic. I don't, I think I had assumed there were people moving them around.
Good evening. Uh, thank you, Rodney, for that lecture. <clears throat> and thank you for all the work you are doing to add to our understanding of Pan-Africanism in Barbados, to understanding more about Israel Lovell and the other working class Garveyites within Barbados. Um, just before I get into what I, um, the comment I wish to make, I just want to clear up that little piece of myth making. Marcus Garvey did not grow up in a, in a white neighborhood. Marcus Garvey was born and grew up in St. Anne's Bay in Jamaica. He came from peasant and um, artisanal stock. In fact, the, the foundation of his self-confidence and his sense of self-worth came out of that peasant and artisanal, that independent artisanal um, tradition. In fact, he was, he was um, taught by his godfather the skills of printing. He became, he became an expert printer, and that had a lot to do with his success um, as a journalist, as a printer of the Negro world and the black man and so forth. He did speak about having one white girl as a friend <laughs> that he interacted with as, as a child. But anyhow... Um, I, I don't so much want to um, ask a question, Rodney, as to just to make a comment. Um, you would know that last year I published this book, The Pan-African Love Story of Arnold and Mignon Ford. And I just want to record the fact that it was said that the personality who was second only to Garvey as the public face of the Universal Negro Improvement Association was Rabbi Arnold Josiah Ford, a Barbadian who was born in Barbados in um, 1877 and uh, who became the musical director of the UNIA. But not just the musical director, because Arnold Ford had um, enlisted in the British Navy so he had had a military training. And because of that military background, it was he who, in a sense, um, took control of the, of the organizing of Garvey's paramilitary forces. It was he who, who um, wrote the regulations for the um, Garvey's legion and, and so forth. Um, also, his wife, his Barbadian wife, Mignon, Mignon Innes Ford, a uh, very outstanding Garveyite as well. She migrated to, to Harlem um, in the 1920s and um, became a member of the Harlem branch of the UNIA, um, where she met Arnold, and she eventually followed Arnold to Ethiopia. And they became, in fact, Arnold accomplished what Garvey was unable to accomplish. Arnold actually led um, a Back to Africa repatriation movement um, to, to Ethiopia. So I, I just want to say that um, when, we, when we are looking at um, Garveyism in Barbados, that I want us to, to, to look as well at the Barbadians who, admittedly outside of Barbados, but Barbadians who made a very important um, contribution to the Marcus Garvey uh, movement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions for Dr. Wu? Mm -hmm. No, no, no. Ron. Mm Um, blessings, family. Blessings, blessings, blessings be multiplied. Dr. Earl, we salute you. And I think it is very important that our scholars be on the right part of history. And not only when it is popular, but sometimes when it is unpopular, to say the things that needs to be said for the advancement 
of African people here in Barbados. We just commemorated the People's Uprising 1937 in Golden Square. Visiting my family was a young family from Guadeloupe. And when she heard Mia speak, she began to cry. Because she said that she longed for the day when Guadeloupe can have a prime minister speaking as such. Because today, Guadeloupe is still a colony of France. In the presentation, I was truly amazed to see the amount of traffic and business being conducted on Roebuck Street. And today, Roebuck Street is as a ghost town. We are majority blacks within this country, 95%, yet we still function as a minority. Dr. Worrell, sir, what realistically can be done to change this? A political yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that, that is a big question. That, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It is a big question. If I had the answer, I probably would be a millionaire. So I no need to come in here and give this little talk. But um, we're talking about when we think about colonialism and the 300 and how many years and still this colonial enterprise and we look at the damage psychologically to the people and we look at the colonial structures that are still very much there yeah well, we're not talking about something that can be knocked down tomorrow right? this this is this is an ongoing struggle and this is why, um, yeah, persons like yourself and others of like mind, I um, have to continue to, and, and, and don't be defeated. Because Garvey encountered, um, yeah, a, a very um, wretched period, you know, when Garvey came. This was a, a low point, one of the lowest points, right, um, in the history of black people in the early 20th century. So um, I'm saying all of this to say that we can't be self-defeatists. We have to be optimistic, and we have um, we had a saying within the Pan-African movement that, yeah, we just can't agonize, but we must organize and continue to struggle. That is the only way to bring about this change. Thank you very much. Um, I see we have special envoy and buddy. Buddy, you want to go first? I think you had your hand up first, and then we come to special envoy. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Worrell for excellent presentation. I was gripped with how erudite you are with the names and the events that take us through that whole period from the 1920s to the present. I want to add to the question that was asked by Emperor, Reverend Emperor Wells. And I listened to what the Prime Minister said. This is building up to the question. What the Prime Minister said on the 26th of uh, July at the uh, Golden Square 
event. She said that the 1661 Slave Code Act inspired the North American initiative. In other words, what we are struggling with, and I'm going to ask you the question to support what Amphra asked. If Barbados is the first country that passed a law in 1661 that said that black people were not full human beings, it would mean that the law did not say that white people were superior to anyone, but that black people were inferior to everyone. <laughs> and as a result of that, it would appear that every other racial group treat us as inferior. Now, if Barbados, and the, this is where the question is, if Barbados is 395 years old, and if the history that you and other uh, historians like yourself has taught us that when Barbados, when the Europeans landed here, in 1627, uh, that there were no people on the island. But they landed with 10 African people, which they captured from a Portuguese ship. It would mean that the first experimentation of a nation started with Barbados as a black and a white world, a rich and a poor world, and a man's world because there were no women on the island. If that history is true, what are you all doing taking into consideration that throughout your presentation, October seemed to be, to, to be featured very prominently. And that the people of Gary's movement was so determined to teach and to preach and to advocate my question is, following up and supporting what Umpra said, what are you all as professional historians doing to help us understand how to get out of this uh, quagmire that we are in? Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, um, yeah, as usual, buddy, with a big question. Um, you see, I don't, I don't want to analyze the history in a, a historical way, but I don't think that if, if maybe is my was my shortcoming just now. But we're talking about the 1920s and the 1930s. The 1920s in Barbados was a period of brutal exploitation. Barbadians, the standard of living in Barbados was the worst across the Caribbean. You know, so I, I want people to to get that in, inside their heads, right? Racism was the most acute as well inside the Barbados. You had the dominance of the plantocracy as well. So we, we're talking about immense. Struggle. So, like today, we, we, we have to look and, you know, we have the, the revolutionists, you say, um, 
Revolutions don't run in a straight line, but we have to take some of the tangential victories. Right? So um, you, you ask, you now uh, I'm saying, I, yeah, I wrote the thing there and I try, yeah, and I'm saying that, yes, what are persons like myself doing? <laughs> I think this is self evident, and here talking, and my whole research agenda is about, yeah educating people about researching and bringing these ideas to the fore. Um, hopefully, people will use this information. Um, some of them will use this information, in your view, wisely, and some of them will keep the information to their chest, and maybe also the information will be used to liberate somebody psychological as well that something that I can't measure or you can't measure as well so um, yeah I, I think that yeah I, I, I'm not like <laughs> I'm not like the other scholars I am a Rodneyite I'm rooted with the people and the struggles of the working people that is why I study the working people Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Grant. Um, good night, Rodney. Uh, and I, I believe I can call you that. Oh. They're, they're my friend, but I also respect you for your scholarship. <laughs> um, I'm happy that you've actually spoken um, about Israel Lovell. I believe that people like Lovell and some of the outstanding Pan-Africanists in the first half of the 20th century, because of the education which we have had, the major contribution that they have made to the shaping and the thinking of the black Barbadian working class has been suppressed over a number of years. Um, I believe this is now a period for us of enlightenment now. And since we now have a lot of black scholars around us, I believe it is your responsibility and the responsibility of the black scholars who make it a realistic and genuine assessment of even that history that was distorted. The, the onus is now placed on you at least to be out a lot more in the public domain. I know that you, 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 you are very much a scholar that wants to relate to the working class people. Sometimes you can't get a chance as much as you would like to do it at the University of the West Indies. So I am asking that we see a lot more of Dr. World speaking to the people of Barbados, but more so than some of the other historians across Barbados. <laughs> I, I announced that as a friend, but in this case, I believe it's on the basis of merit. Uh. Now, I think Israel Lovell, for me, I'm like David, established the Clement Payne said that mm -hmm. I established the Israel Lovell Foundation, and what you have said tonight is enough justification on why these two personalities is very much major institutions of the grassroot, at the grassroots level in Barbados. But I would love to hear um, some more what little I know, and I'm sure that many, the, many of the people in the audience also would like to know a little more, especially about Lovell's radicalism in the Westbury arm of the UNIA. I think that is very important. And what was the distinction between the arm that he led in Barbados and the other arms across Barbados of the UNIA? And how his influence impacted a lot on all that occurred, especially in the first half from the 1920s in, in Barbados right down to after the 1937 uh, Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, my, yeah, my comrade and, and brother. Um, I, I, we used to go to, yeah, and we still do it, to St. George, St. George's Parish Church, to Lovell's, um, grave, and um, I remember the former um, 
Okay, with his former Cuban and former Venezuelan ambassador. And he said, you know, um, I, I, I went there and I promised that I was going to write something on Laville. And he said, you know, you historians take forever to write this, this stuff, you know. <laughs> However, um, yeah, I did write something on, on, on Laville. Um, and it was published in... Yeah, a, a journal. So, um, if John, you can bring that bag there for me, please. Right. So, yeah, I, in an effort to, yeah, re, re, redress or address some of, of these, some of the deficiencies. Um, right. Yeah, I, I just want to give you the, the title, and, and Travel would be aware of this work. And the title is Israel Lovell, UNIA President and Political Activist in Barbados, 1919 to 1937. And it was published in the 76 King Street the Journal of Liberty Hall, The Legacy of Marcus Garvey. And I, and, and I published it there because, one, I, my supervisor was Professor Rupert Lewis, one of the foremost Garveyite scholars. And once his name was associated with the Liberty Hall Journal, was one of the reasons I published there. So, um, so I have done, yeah. So you can you can say that I have done some work <laughs> on Laville, right? Now, it the task of a historian is 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 very difficult. Um, so not a lot of information, and if I find it, I will jump and scream about Laville in the early, the early 1920s. Uh, you see that he appeared in 1920 when there was, um, when there was the obvious split between the two entities. Then you see that there's some harmony between the, the two, um, Westbury and the Reed Street, the Street branch, because he's sitting at the head table when um, I think it was Reverend Talbot or had passed through Barbados. You see more of Laville coming in the 1930s when he's a member of the Working Men's Association. Um, so not a lot is known about his UNIA days. Right? We, um, Robert Hill is doing a fantastic job in putting out um, the RV papers. But um, I think the last copy that I had was volume 13, and I'm hoping that there's a volume 14 and 15. Hopefully, they will shed uh, more information. You're dependent a lot on the police records. Whilst there was a lot of information carried inside the Weekly Illustrated and the Barbados Times on the Westbury branch, obvious because Harold Wilson he was the editor, the publisher of those papers, but not a lot of information. So it's painstaking work. So hopefully, if I stumble on the work, I will bring it to the fore, but I'm willing to talk about what I know about Laville. And yeah, unlike, <laughs> right, I, I, I don't create the, the facts, right? I follow the the evidence as close as, as possible. Thank you. So we have Mr. Marshall and then probably one more, and that's it. Sorry. Joy? Oh, go ahead, Joy. Hello, Dr. Wilwood. Thanks for that. Um, Come forward and speak into the um, mic. Thanks for that journey through time. And I have two simple questions. One, I would like you to please expand a bit on the whole question of the school. I find it fascinating to hear that a school, they established a school, and given the era that it was in, and the point that you just made, how oppressive Barbados was at the time, who were the students? Do you have that information? Who were the teachers? What were the curriculum like? And how long it lasted? Just, that, that just fascinated me. Mm -hmm. And secondly, well, you alluded a bit just now there to my second question, which was how do you gather this information? But 
one of the things that you did say remind me of apartheid. And you said you relied a lot on police reports. And I always questioned when I was reading in the papers, police reports stated that this happened. Now you, you have an oppressive regime and we're relying on information from that oppressive regime. How then <laughs> does that really give an insight into the real like functioning? Was there minutes? Was there, I, I, um, I, as you said, the task of the historian is tough. So if you rely on police report, was there like minutes? Was there like, um, I don't know, at this time there won't be anybody alive to really give you a, so just basically how do you, I just fascinated. Thanks. Thanks, okay. for, thanks for that travel through time with that information. Yeah, um, uh, my sister Joy, yeah, she's, She's special to me. I have two, two special ladies in the Pan-African, well, I should say three. <laughs> yeah, but she and sister Angela, well, I said three because I'm thinking about my elder sister, um, Dr. Viola Davis, who is, yeah, special to me. Um, yeah, Joy, there was a, a, a night school um, and, and the, there was the recognition of illiteracy was very high across the island, huh? right? And people were working in the fields and at 10 years old and all kinds of things like this. Although they were talking about, in fact, O'Neill spent a lot of time in the 1920s trying to stamp out um, child labor and, and these kind of things. So when the school was first opened, I think they anticipated like 70 something people, but they after the second or third night of this school, you had about 200 and something students, right? Um, and a lot of these students came from some of the, the poor section of society. I think um, the notion was if John, John Beckles was saying, if you don't save these individuals, they become, um, the term was wharf rats or something that was used, right? This, I guess this was the lowest of the law. Um, the school had, I think, about eight or nine teachers, right? And the names that I, I mentioned, um, yeah, A.G. Torn, um, Smithen, um, Eldika Griffith, etc. These were some of the teachers. There was a blueprint for UNIA schools, right? There was a blueprint, and there was a, a curriculum for UNIA schools to follow as well. And also, um, the curriculum was also age-based. So you had, you had a section for boys, a section for girls, infant section, et cetera. Um, out of the school, you had the Black Cross nurses being trained. You also had um, the, 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 the male equivalent to the, the Black Cross nurses, et cetera. Um, yeah, we, we can spend some time yeah, talking about the syllabus, but part of it was giving the people uh, things like etiquette, things like skills, um, history of black people, um, history of Yarvism and, and these kinds of things. For example, the Black Cross nurses would be school and right, all of what they believe that the lady should know, etc. Now, I think the police records are very accurate. And, and the police, if when you read the records, right, the police is trying to, they're at the meetings, and they're saying what was said at the meeting. So, um, and, and you don't have time to go, and I don't see that these records are distorting what the individuals are saying. There was a meeting inside the hall last night. Um, 21 persons attended. Um, Alexandrina Gibbs said that a race for the continent. Um, this body is saying this, so you're relying on this information. Um, you try as best to cross-reference this information, but let us say if newspapers are available or other sources. Um, but I don't, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I am not um, very suspicious of this. You know, maybe, I'd, maybe if I examine the records at another period. Um, Manning Marble, my 
favorite historian. He wrote a book on Malcolm X strictly from the FBI records. And the same question was asked of him. And he said, you know, sometimes the most accurate records, right? We can work out when they're distorting the records as well. But, um, right, so if, if you look at the, the records, for example, on the Garvey movement, you see there was a meeting and this body said this. So they're talking about Africa, right? <laughs> or there's a call inside the meeting or something like that. Now, sometimes you have to ask questions of your sources. But generally, yeah, you, you, you feel fairly uh, confident about quoting these sources. I know Trevor uh, always asks that question as well. So, <laughs> yeah, go ahead, um, my brother. Final Marshall. question for the night. I hope not, because the gentleman behind me is lecturer at the university, yeah. and he lectures on KRV. So can I just say and let him be the second one? Go ahead, of course. Thank you. Of course. Good we'll evening, question. Good evening, everyone. And to my brother, uh, Rodney, an excellent lecture. Congratulations. I just want to make a few points, and I don't even know if I should answer, ask a question. But we begin with the fact that where Joy left off about how do you get uh, material? Now, Okay, straight historians, political historians, go for documentation. I'm a social and cultural historian. Anybody would know that my work involves talking to the people. And I think it is two weeks ago, two, three weeks ago, a lady died at 100 years old. And she traveled from St. John, and I come from St. She traveled from St. John to Queens Park to see and hear the right excellent Marcus Messiah Garvey. And she has shared with, she shared with me her recollections of Garvey. And Arthur Edwards, Arthur who attended the same school as I, Lord School, um, he is, <laughs> he made a comment, made a comment which is very extremely important because in those days, people who saw Garvey they commented first and, first and foremost on his facial features. He was called a pig. Look at his cheeks, the prognathism, the African, the Yoruba cheeks. For those, he was ridiculed because you remember uh, his, um, his opponent was W.E. Burgard Dubois. Dubois who looked like, what, David Thompson. Profile, coloring, etc. So you can imagine those two people uh, agitating for the support of the black majority, the black minority in the USA and throughout the Caribbean. Garvey was ridiculed for his features. I mean, the term ugly as Garvey, ugly as sin. No, pe people, and then anybody who, do, who says they did not hear that, do not, they do not come from the country or do, they have not been examining and listening to the people that I have listened to. Furthermore, a gentleman just died this year, I think it was, it was this year, Etherine Garvey Husbands, a high court judge from Colleton Tenantry, St. John. His parents call him Etherine and Garvey. The priest ridiculed the name. So his, his, on his birth certificate, it is E-T-H-R-I-N-E, Etherine Husbands not Garvey. So I'm just saying that to bolster your point, right? And to indicate that there's much more to Garvey than what the police statements indicate and much more what we knew. Now, you, uh, you very kindly mentioned the fact that in 1987, I was part of a group with Viola Davis, Kathleen Drayton, Lloyd Jones, etc. We, we started the Marcus Garvey movement. And people ask you, why, why are you all talking about this ugly black man? And I think that's the point that, this is the point that you must understand about Garvey. Look at those features. He, those features on the day, just like Toussaint Louverture, he was not the pinup uh, movie star. But the point, is, and the point to be made is that Garvey inspired people in Barbados at all levels. There are centenarians today 
who know Garvey, who saw Garvey, who came to the steel shed and, and heard Garvey. Furthermore, uh, you look at the colors of, sh of the flags. Ghana, the Ghanaian flag, red, gold, green, black, Garvey. The colors of the Rastafari movement, and I'm wearing my Garvey shirt. Ites, red, gold, green, and black, right? And these are remnants of what people knew and admired about Garvey. Furthermore, you mentioned the land ship. The women in the land ship were not only encouraged to be in the land ship, but they were called stars. From his movement in 1919 in Harlem, Garvey induced and introduced women into his movement, and he labeled them stars, and he gave them a uniform, and he gave them prominence, etc. So the point is that uh, the, to answer you joy through you, or you through joy, police records and other documentation are useful for us. I have gone long beyond police records. I, I talk to the people. I go to the people every day, every throughout Barbados, everywhere throughout Barbados, and ask questions about those aspects of our history. And I'm willing to share my material with you. Right. Now, my question to you is. <laughs> I don't understand. You mean, you mean I was talking too long? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> my question. <laughs> uh huh. Oh, before you ask the question. Before I ask a question, and perhaps I will not ask a question, but to share this information with you. At the Barbados Community College, in my last 10 years there, 2004 to 2014, I introduced a course called Com Contemporary Caribbean History. And the subtitle was From Marcus Garvey to Morris Bishop. We started off teaching people, you mentioned Marcia Burroughs, you mentioned Lisa Cummins, Santia Bradshaw, Kirk Humphrey, all of them went through that course. Uh, my friend, um, Monsieur, Monsieur, lecturer, huh? yeah, he can tell you. Uh, someone was asking, what are the academics doing? The academics are teaching about Garvey. It is within the cloistered realm of Cave Hill, and I must say that when I left community college, my courses were <laughs> abandoned. <laughs> but my good friend here will continue to, to say something about what is being done. Because he teaches a course in, uh, as you well know, he's your colleague, he teaches a course in um, the philosophy and opinions yeah. of Garvey. Car Caribbean, Caribbean political philosophy. Right. Yeah, I, I, I know the course well because I'm his second marker and was his second marker for many Precisely. years. So, uh, <laughs> uh -huh. so I, I, I also, uh, I think I taught that course a, a year for my comrade as well. So, yeah, I know the course well. And my small question was, why, I didn't hear you say anything about the Garvey branch in the north or branches in the north, but we do know there were some at Crab Hill yeah, I, Crab I, Hill, yeah. not just Whitestone, but as far north as Crab Hill in the parish behind Buck Garden. Yeah, but I, I did mention that, and I'm saying that, and I quoted John Alling, who said that there were branches in Spitestone and elsewhere. Yeah, so, um, yeah, but I, I, I don't like to dwell on, you know, um, the Garvey, the boys, the ugly part of that discussion about how people look. I prefer to, to dwell on the outstanding political thought. I don't think this, this kind of conversation carried discussion anyway. All right, so definitely final question for the Go night ahead. and keep it tight. Yeah, yeah. We have one more presentation to come before we close the night. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair, for accommodating me. Um, I just wanted to add my voice to the congratulations to Comrade Rodney um, for the, not just for the lecture tonight, but for his entire um, research program and also his public intellectual Work. I think what um, former Minister Trevor was pointing to was not so much not so much that was really the fact that Rodney Rodney's scholarship is not just bourgeois intellectualism for its own sake, but he has a kind of political commitment to the task, and he also is um, he's a he's a he's a, he's a, he's a an intellectual worker, if you want to put it that way. He's an activist and a scholar, and I think that is what distinguishes him from many. 
But my question is a very simple one, Rod. You give us a very good, I, I think you made your case tonight in showing Gavi's impact from 1919 to the present. But you were very silent on the reparations question because you went through all of the different traces, um, trade unionism, um, mm -hmm. even, even black theology and so forth. But my question is whether or not that omission was because Gavi was silent on the question or whether there was a contradiction between a demand for reparations and Gavi's own notion of black self-reliance. Because some people see the two as contradictory. So I'm just, I just, I'm just inviting you to reflect on, on Gavi and reparations and to explain your silence on the topic yeah, for us tonight. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Very, very good question. But um, I, I think the reparation aspect might have been unfair, um, more in, along the lines of self-repairs. Right, um, for example, we talk about tearing down imperialist statues, right? We talk about um, our heroes and our sheroes, right? So um, this is all part of the reparations agenda, right? All, not all the reparations agenda is based on, um, yeah, looking for from the colonial masters, etc. But I agree with you. Um, I, I think that he was. Yeah, well, thus far, I, I have seen that he was silent. Although I have seen in the ideas of some Garveyites, for example, I think it was Frederick Small in the 1930s, and I always speak about this. Um, he said, fancy we saying that we're free, and we still, we still, the, the king of England is still our head. Now, he was saying so in the 1930s. I mean, we, we were saying that we were free two years ago <laughs> or three years ago, but the queen was still our head of state. So I, I'm saying that we can extrapolate um, out of some of the conversations of the Garveyites. And um, yeah, I think I might have done some small work with this in my paper that, sorry, my forthcoming chapter on the struggle for reparations in Barbados. So, yeah, we, we could talk about that. I thank you, people. You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you very much, Dr. Have Warren. a good evening. Mm -hmm. Thank you, my brother. Thank you so much again, Dr. Rowe, for that riveting lecture and for staying on and taking all of those very pointed questions. Our final performance for the night will be presented by Tavon Boyce, and he will be accompanied on guitar by Anderson Griffith. Tavon started singing at the tender age of three, but it was not until age 10 that he got seriously involved in music. He entered the Richard Stout Teen Talent Competition to further, further hone his skills and vocal abilities where he placed second in the 2018 series. That same year, he also achieved gold and silver awards at NIFCA, as well as incentives for the most promising performance by an individual, along with the James Milliton Award of Excellence. Tavon is also involved in the Music Angel Senior String Orchestra where he plays the viola. He's hoping to further his studies and abilities in the music industry, along with being a teacher in science, and he didn't left out by telling me music as well. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, Tavon Boyce and Anderson Griffith doing the rendition of Redemption Song to close this evening's proceedings. Good evening, everyone. I hope you guys are doing well. You have enjoyed the pr production thus far. I just want to invite you to relax, sit back, and enjoy this performance that we have for you. There are 
by so I to the merchant ships minutes after they took high from the bottomless pit but my hand was made strong by the hand of the Almighty we forward in generation triumphantly won't you help to sing these songs of freedom cause all I ever had is redemption songs Redemption song. Emancipate yourselves from mental slavery. Number to ourselves can free our minds. Have no fear for atomic energy. Cause none of them can stop the time. How long shall they kill our prophets? Who while we stand aside and look Some say it's just a part of it But we've got to fulfill the books So won't you help to sing These songs of freedom Cause all I ever It's redemption songs, redemption songs, redemption songs, oh, redemption, yeah, yeah, emancipate your from mental slavery number two cells can free our minds have no fear for atomic energy cause none of them can stop the time how long shall they kill our prophets who will we stand aside and look 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 how a part of it We've got to fulfill the books. Won't you help to sing these songs of freedom? Cause all I ever had is redemption songs. Redemption songs. Redemption songs, redemption songs. Thank you. No two persons Thank you. Persons thought alike. Each one of them had to find out what he was. If they were only cleaning the streets, then they must do so. If they could serve the world in moral thought, then they should do so. They were not too rugged for such a hope. Some of the greatest men in the world sprung from the gutter and the world would hear about them. Marcus Messiah Garvey. Ladies and gentlemen, 
the Prime Minister's Office of Culture and the National Cultural Foundation wishes to thank Baba John Howell and the Israel Lovell Foundation, Tavon Boyce, Anderson Griffith, Damani Ree, and Raheem Griffith for the performances this evening. <clears throat> you can give them a round of applause. <laughs> Our featured speaker, Dr. Rodney Worrell, lecturer, University of the West Indies, Cave Hill Campus for his informative and insightful lecture on Marcus Garvey's impact on the Barbadian landscape 1919 to 2019. Thank you, Dr. Worrell. <laughs> Thank you to our event and technical production team, Riveting Media TV, AccuSounds Inc., IGM Stage Lighting Inc., the Barbados Landship Association, Mr. Rodney Eiffel, Cultural Officer of Visual Arts, Mr. Rhea Garns, Ms. Michelle Springer, Cultural Officer Research and Documentation, and Ms. Stacey O'Brien, Festival and Events Planner at the NCF. We also wish to thank the members of the media for the coverage of this event, and for you, the audience, both live and online, for joining us this evening. Please join us in the courtyard for some light refreshments. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being here and for joining us this evening. And we ask you to remain seated as the minister leaves and her party, and then you can join us in the courtyard. Thank you very much. Have a pleasant night. It was good seeing you.